Uh, Stephen Tu. He's a PhD student at Berkeley and is interning this summer at, the, um, at Google in the Google Brain team. And he'll be talking about this stuff. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, can everyone hear me? Cool. OK, so today I'm going to talk about a topic that is about as far like to the other side of the, I guess, I don't know, uh, as, the main, as the main topic, right? So there's going to be no PL here. I don't even know what the word homological means. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? OK, so it is, I'm told that it's not that far. So actually, that's good. Then it'll be a good segue. All right, so today we're going to talk about um, basically kind of classical reinforcement learning before it got really deep. Uh, and so, uh, sorry if you wanted to hear about deep Q learning. Uh, uh, we're, we're not quite. I'm not quite there yet. So, all right. Uh, so, I'm going to present this paper. Uh, it's uh, when I wrote this slide, I realized I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name. So, uh, we're just going to read it. Uh, I'm not going to try. Okay. So, cool. All right. So, the primer is so that we want to. I want to get us talking about reinforcement learning. So, we're going to sort of do a kind of a brief crash course on RL. And this is the um, most concise version I could come up with in like less than five minutes. Uh, okay. Cool. So before the obligatory pictures, right? So RL is kind of the underlying technique um, behind a lot of, uh, I, I guess you could say, some recent work um, in industry and academia. This come a lot of exciting results about playing video games, like uh, doing basically, opt uh, you know, continuous control, uh, self-driving cars, and uh, you know, having robotic robots do certain manipulations. So it's very, it's very exciting time for RL. So let's sort of, that, that's maybe hopefully motivating. Um, so what is exactly RL? So this is the sort of very classical setup, is we have an agent here, and the agent is basically going to interact with this environment. You can think of the environment as being nature. And the way this interaction is going to happen is basically the agent is going to sort of, in a loop, uh, play some actions. Uh, and I'll describe what actions mean. Uh, and upon playing action, the agent will basically receive some reward and transition to a current, uh, to a next state. So we have some state that sort of completely describes what the agent, uh, the the current, uh, what completely describes the agent. And the agent's goal here is to sort of maximize reward. So as it sort of plays along, it wants to do do actions that give the highest reward. And that's sort of the thousand level view of reinforcement learning. Okay, so uh, sort of going down a little bit. Uh, maybe a lesser uh, high view of reinforcement learning. What exactly is the, the, the object we want to study in RL? And it's this thing called a Markov decision process, or an MDP. And an MDP is just sort of a fancy way of saying we have basically some state transition function and some reward function. And uh, there's a basically is trying to capture the stochastic nature of this problem. So what is it exactly? So we ha basically have a state space, which you can think of you know, in a discrete time as saying just being a position on a grid. Or in a continuous problem, you can think of it as just like an XYZ co uh, coordinate and uh, velocity. Right, so from Newtonian physics, we know that, for instance, position and velocity is enough to, to uniquely determine the future outcomes. Um, and so that's a state space, and there's an action space, which is kind of what the moves the agent can play. So in a grid, might maybe going up, down, left, right. Uh, in the real world, maybe it might be applying some force in some direction. Right? So that's the state and action space. And the way that the agent interacts with the environment is through this thing called a transition function. So an agent is going to basically propose its current state and a, a, an action to take, and it's going to then receive a probability distribution over the next set of actions that it could transition to. Right? So you can imagine uh, the probability distribution here is just to allow nature to be random and not be completely deterministic, although you can encode determinism in a probability distribution by just putting mass on the, you know, uh, you can have like a Dirac, Dirac uh, mass distribution. So that's the state transition function. And then there's also this thing called a reward function, which basically, given a state in action, describes how good um, um, that, that pair was. And the important thing about reinforcement learning, which distinguishes it from more classical control theory, is that the, the transition function and possibly the reward function is unknown to the algorithm. right? So the algorithm basically has to optimize rewards without actually knowing the dynamics. And if you come from a more control theoretic background, that's a uh, kind of the complete opposite of how control theory works, which basically first posits that you have some dynamical system, and then you try to actually do uh, optimization over that dynamical system. So reinforcement learning is sort of a way of kind of doing th this optimal control stuff without ever actually explicitly describing what the dynamics are. And that's kind of what makes it really interesting. 
Right. So the goal of reinforcement learning is to find a policy pi. And a policy is just nothing more than a, a, a function that maps states to action. So if I'm, you know, I have this current configuration of the board, I'm going to propose to do this action. Right? That's a policy. And the goal is to basically find a policy that maximizes its expected reward over time. So this function here, this vpi here, is just saying if I s play my dynamics, if I play my policy and I allow for the dynamics to be stochastic, what is the expected reward I'm going to get in the infinite horizon? So this is an infinite horizon discounted uh, MDP. And the discount here is this gamma to the k, which basically says we're going to sort of discount the things that happen in the future uh, much less, exponentially less than the things that are happening right now. And in this talk, we're going to focus primarily on the easier problem. All right, so so reinforcement learning says optimize this function over all policies, right? So we're gonna I'm gonna first talk about how do we even just evaluate given a fixed policy, how do we evaluate this function, and then we can talk about optimization. So the, we're gonna focus on the easier problem first, uh, and it turns out that's actually a good building block for the optimization, uh, as we'll see, which is what the LSPI algorithm is trying to do. Right, so for a given policy, the thing that we want to basically compute or score is this thing known as a value function. And what it's basically saying is that if we start at a current state, so we're going to fix the current configuration that we start at, and then we're just going to play the policy you know, infinitely, which just means that you know, if I'm going to you know, take my current state as zero, I'm going to take the action, and then I'm going to follow that dynamics model along that trajectory, and I'm going to take the expectation. And the question that we want to answer is, how do we evaluate this function for a fixed policy? Right? So uh, it's not, maybe not immediately obvious. This looks like a kind of a complicated expectation or a complicated quantity. How do we even evaluate this function for a fixed policy? OK. So there's really like one overarching principle in reinforcement learning that basically drives all the algorithms. And this is, I'm going to call this the fundamental equation of RL. This is also known as the Bellman equation. Um, and all this is basically saying is that there, uh, a, a, um, a candidate function v pi is the solution to this problem uh, if it satisfies this uh, fixed point equation. So all this is saying is basically the current value is equal to essentially what is known as a one-step rollout, right? So you're basically going to play the policy on the current state, and then you're going to ask the value function what is the uh, expected reward uh, over all the, the distributions I can, uh, sorry, all the states I can transition to an expectation, right? So this is what is known as the Bellman equation. And um, right, so Solving reinforcement learning a lot of times comes down to just solving this equation, really. And what does that mean? So let's show Bellman's equation in action. So uh, in order to do this, I'm going to focus on a very simplified dynamics model. And what it is is it's going to be this discrete linear time invariant system. So if you're familiar with controls, this is probably the most simple basic object you can study. Uh, and what this is saying is basically that my current, st my, my state transition is just going to be a linear operator applied on uh, the, the state, so it's A times X plus B times U. So I'm going to have, I'm going to start to say X, I'm going to apply the map A to it, and then I'm going to add that to, I'm going to play some uh, action U, and then I'm going to apply the map B to it, and I'm going to add some Gaussian noise. Right, so this is like the simplest linear time system you could, uh, or the simplest dynamical system you can cook up that is continuous time state space, or is there a continuous state space? And also to this, we're going to associate a quadratic reward function. And the reason we do this is it turns out it actually is, uh, makes the math really, uh, it makes the math clean. So there's really no reason you need to pick a quadratic reward function other than it that makes the math clean. But uh, so this is his this problem here is known as the linear quadratic regulator. So this is a very classical problem in optimal control. Right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to derive the value function for LQR. And this might seem like, why do we care about this problem? But it's going to turn out that when we actually go to reinforcement learning, we're going to do basically the same thing. So I'm going to do this very concretely, and then we're going to do this abstractly, and then that will basically give us the algorithm. All right, so to derive the, uh, uh, the, the value function for LQR, uh, I'm going to assume that the policy is just a simple linear feedback policy. So it's parameterized by some matrix K, and you just, hit the, you just act, on it, you, you act on the current state by K. And it turns out that this is actually the only policy you need to solve the LQR problem. So this is not without loss of generality. That might not be obvious, but it, it turns out this is all you need. Um, so the way we're going to do this is we're basically going to guess some parameterization of the value function. And we've guessed that it's going to be quadratic. Uh, why you might guess that, uh, that's just because someone told you. Or we're basically going to do guess and check, right? So how do you solve an ODE? You guess the form. You plug it in the ODE. You verify it's all solution. We're gonna, that's basically the same thing we're going to do with the Bellman equation. So uh, we're going to guess some quadratic form for the value function. And then we're just going to plug in the Bellman equation and solve for P and Q. And so skipping, like this, the, the, the details of this derivation are not important, but the point is we basically started with that uh, fixed point, we used our assumption, and then we 
rearranged terms and we're able to actually solve for the value function. And then we sort of play this argument backwards and says we found a fixed point because you know, it satisfies all these things by construction. So it's actually, we're basically doing the proof by construction. Right? So it turns out right, you can actually solve this in closed form uh, for LQR, which is why it's such a nice problem. OK, cool. So now to RL, we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to be a little bit more general. So this is known as least squares temporal differencing. So we're going to do the same thing, but now we're going to assume, instead of sort of for LQR, we assumed we had a quadratic uh, uh, value function. Now we're going to assume this thing known as a linear architecture, which means we're going to assume the value function is basically some feature map phi, phi uh, that acts on the current state, lifts it to a higher dimensional state, and then, and then the function is going to be linear in that high dimensional state. So if you're familiar with sort of nonlinear regression or kernel methods of machine learning, this is basically the same idea, right? We're just going to take some state and we're going to map it to some higher dimensional state and then everything will be linear in that. Um, and this isn't a very this is not that restrictive of an assumption as we actually solve for LQR. It exactly falls into this uh, category. So we can solve this problem in this generality. We've actually also given an algorithm for the most simple control problem, which is a good sanity check. And uh, if you were, uh, you, you can kind of see that the feature map for LQR is this kind of ugly looking thing. Uh, the details aren't important, it's just quadratic in the state. Okay, so we're gonna play the same game again. We're gonna take that value function, we're gonna take the Bellman equation, Right, remember the fixed point, and then we're going to plug in this linear architecture assumption into the Bellman equation. Right, so when we just plug that in, that's what the first line here is saying, and then the second line we're just going to use linearity of expectation, basically to move the inner product outside of the expectation, and then we're going to rearrange terms. And the important thing here is that we've actually written essentially a y equals you know ax kind of thing, or y equals like a a mx kind of thing, right? Because we said the reward on the left-hand side is equal to the inner product of some vector here, right? That only depends on the state uh, and, and the thing that we're after, right? The weights that we're after. So this is really interesting, right? Because it basically says that we can solve RL by just solving a least squares problem or solving a linear system of equations uh, under this assumption. So that's exactly what a very uh, natural thing you might actually try doing, right? So you've got this, you've got this basically this y equals mx kind of assumption, and that suggests that basically we can do linear regression or li solve these linear equations where the x variable is just this thing here I've written here, um, and the target is just going to be the reward at a current um, point, right? So, so the way you, this would work is you would collect some trajectory, you would roll your system out, right? You would actually play the agent forward, you would collect basically x1 to say xn, and then you would then basically regress x1 to x against x2. Like you would plug in, you know, xi and x. And, uh, well, sorry, we're not quite there. Well, you would basically use each of the points as one of these covariates, and you would get uh, basically n, n, so n equations and n, and so if, as long as you have n greater than like the size of your feature map, then you would expect you might be able to invert this thing. So the thing, the tricky thing here is like we can't evaluate this expectation, and the whole thing about reinforcement learning is that we don't know these dynamics, right? So how do we solve this? So in the LQR case, if you knew the dynamics, you could solve this, but in this case, you don't. So we're going to have to do something different. OK. So a very natural idea from like stochastic approximation is every time we see an expectation, let's just take an unbiased estimate of that and then, do, and then just pretend like it's the right thing. So that's exactly what you might imagine doing. This is a very natural thing you might want to do. And it's, uh, so here, the unbiased uh, uh, draw of that expectation is just you know, from x1 to x2. That gives me an unbiased transition from x2 to x3. That's another transition. So I can imagine then just forming these covariates and this target and doing linear regression. So we just do standard linear regression here, and then you would get some estimator, right? And the nice thing about this is now this is completely implementable, right? I can take an agent. I can just roll it out under some policy. I can solve the system of equations, and now I have a candidate uh, value function. OK. So uh, it is not entirely obvious, and, um, but that previous estimator is not exactly what you want. So it's really close, but because of the way the problem is structured, there is some inherent bias in that estimator. And the way you fix this is the sort of the nugget of wisdom in this least squares temporal differencing paper. Uh, and it's so the, what you do is you make a slight tweak. So you're not quite doing least squares anymore, but this is still an implementable estimator. You make some slight tweak to it, and now you get something that doesn't have this bias problem. I'm not going to go over that derivation. You can see the paper for that. Um, but so if effectively, you, know, you can take this least squares problem, kind of tweak it a little bit, and now you have some nice estimator to score value function, right? So now you've got that W estimator. OK, so I said we really want to optimize and just not just evaluate. So let's move from evaluation optimization. Uh, and the way you do that, and that's exactly what this LSPI algorithm is. So LSPI, least squares policy iteration, is just using what we talked about, this least squares temporal differencing estimator, this, this guy, as a, as a sort of an evaluation primitive. 
And the idea is that you basically do an outer loop of what's known as policy iteration. And I'll explain what that is in a moment. And you do an inner loop of, of, of the least squares temporal differencing. On, and, and instead of using the value function, you're going to use this thing called the Q function, which is very similar to value function. The only reason I didn't de develop everything with the Q function is because it's slightly more notation. But the idea here is that you just, you, instead of just fixing the current state as 0, you're also going to fix the first action A. Zero, and then you're going to play. So, so then you're going to parameterize this Q function by this tuple, and then you're going to play the policy forward, right? So it's just basically unrolling the expectation by one and parameterizing it by uh, uh, by A here. Okay. So the nice thing about Q functions is that you can actually get policies from Q functions, right? So every Q function actually induces a policy. Uh, and the way you do that is you give me a current state S, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix S, and I'm going to optimize that Q function over all A. And the thing that achieves that, so for, for now, let's assume that the, 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 the maximum is actually achieved. And the thing that achieves the maximum, I'm just going to call that the action I'm going to play. So my policy then basically takes the current state, it, uh, it does the arg max on the Q function, and that gives me a new, and that's, that is the description of my policy. Right, so you can see basically from every Q function, I can describe some policy. And then the idea is then, given a new policy, I can score that policy's you know, Q function, right? So here I've called that pi plus, right? I can just use least squares temporal differencing again, and then I can s come up with a new Q function for that, and then I can then create a new policy pi plus plus that uh, um, I can create a new policy pi plus plus that basically is a better policy than the, the existing one, and we just loop this process over and over again, right? So that's exactly what least squares uh, policy iteration is. We're basically going to use this primitive we have, uh, least squares temporal differencing, to actually score Q functions and then improve the policies. So this, this argmax here is what's known as policy improvement, right? And so you can imagine just running this in a loop, and this is something that you can actually implement on a computer. So that's all LSPI is doing. Um, okay, so that's, that was LSPI in a nutshell, and uh, I'm going to take some questions, but first I'll leave up some references if you're interested in more of that stuff, and I also have some backup slides if we want have some more questions about some of this derivations here. Cool. Thank you, Stephen. Um, <laughs>